Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Tuesday, September 27th. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and as usual, I'll be your host and moderate a question and answer session after our formal presentation. Today's webinar is entitled Next Generation Sequencing, an Emerging Technique for Measurable Residual Disease, MRD, Detection in Acute Myeloid Leukemia. This important webinar is made possible by a special educational grant from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and we want to acknowledge their support, and I want to thank them for their help in allowing us to bring you today's session. Our single speaker, and I'll say more about him in due course, is Dr. Gerald Radich of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. But before we begin, I want to, as usual, uh, give you some housekeeping tips that I think will help your enjoyment of today's program. First, we always recommend that you refresh your browser in addition, if you look at the right hand, bottom right hand corner of your screen, we have live help that will be available all during today's webinar. If you have any trouble, you can call in at 858-345-5916. In addition, if you have technical problems, either with the audio or with the website, you can type in that problem in the Q&A box, which you see there below the slide. And again, we have live people that will attempt to help you and, you and almost always can fix whatever is your problem. Of course, the Q&A box below the slide is primarily for your questions and comments, which you can make anytime during today's webinar. And uh, they'll we, we'll have that question and answer session after our formal presentation. I want you to know you'll be able to view the full slides and audio in about a week. We'll post that at captodayonline.com. You should also know you'll see some follow-up email from ourselves and very likely from Thermo Fisher. So I wanted to alert you to that fact. And finally, and very importantly, Please know that CAP Today does not endorse any product or service that may be mentioned in today's webinar. Of course, any comments of mine are purely personal and not to be taken as the policy of CAP Today or the College of American Pathologists. And now let us begin. I'm going to uh, introduce our topic once again, next-gen sequencing and emerging technique for MRD detection in acute myeloid leukemia. It's a pleasure for us to work again with Gerald Radich, who is a medical oncologist in the Clinical Research Division. He holds the Kurt Ensline Endowed Chair at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. He's got an incredibly interesting presentation for you today. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Radich to begin. Right after, I read you the disclosure, which is important that we I'll share with you, and I'm going to read it on his behalf. Thermo Fisher Scientific and its affiliates are not endorsing, recommending, or promoting any use or application of Thermo Fisher Scientific products presented by third parties during this seminar. Information and materials presented or provided by third parties are provided as is and without warranty of any kind including regarding intellectual property rights and reported results. Parties presenting images, text, and material represent they have the rights to do so. Our speaker was provided with an honorarium by Thermo Fisher Scientific for this presentation. And now with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Gerald Radich. Dr. Radich. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jerry from Seattle. Uh, Thanks for that introduction, Bob. Um, so if people are having trouble hearing me at all, please enter something into the chat. Uh, if not, I'll just assume that you're out there somehow in the, <laughs> in the ether, um, as weird as it is talking into a, a computer. Here we go. Uh, 
Um, what I'm going to talk about today is is measurable residual disease in AML, and, and it's going to be sort of more of a clinically uh, biased uh, talk. We'll have some technical issues, uh, but I really want to talk about how it's done these days, really uh, what it means in using AML as a case study, and talk about some new national uh, initiatives. So this is kind of a background of you know, if the, the curve cartoon here on the left. Um, if one curve could be, uh, you could reduce your entire academic um, and career, this would be it for me, um, which is either shows focus or is sort of sad. Um, really, patients, any pa cancer patients, but we we'll discuss here mostly AML, can do really three things. They can be refractory, that is not respond to therapy. Uh, they can go into a deep remission here with the green line, um, or they can do what this is really about to today. They can get into what appears to be a remission, and then they can relapse. Again, all cancers do that in leukemias. This curve is about 15% of the time. This is about 20% of the time. This is the vast majority of patients who get into a, a, a mission and relapse. And so what we're going to talk about now is today is what do you do with these people who are here who are under this line, which is where morphological relapse or, or is defined, and what does MRD mean? And we'll talk about uh, this middle as a meta-analysis we'll talk about. It's been done recently. Um, but I think that AML is a really good example of how to use AML uh, uh, MRD um, because it's a disease where patients can be cured, roughly 25 to 40 percent of patients. Uh, the genetic landscape is actually pretty small, especially compared to solid tumors. It really, about 25 mutations covers the uh, entire spectrum of pathogenic mutations, and most patients only have three to five mutations uh, per patient, which is much, much less than uh, many of the solid tumors. Um, and I think one of the things I want to really emphasize is the, is the slogan down here is that when we talk about MRD, uh, it's, it's both a measure of disease burden uh, and it's a measure of disease biology. So it's not just really just a number. Um, there is a biology to MRD that, that needs to be studied to understand how to utilize it uh, further in our doctor patient care. So, so right now, if you look across the leukemia, there's a number of ways to measure MRD. Flow cytometry is the most common in ALL and AML, and the pro of that is that it's fast and fairly sensitive. Uh, the con is it's been hard to standardize across different labs. Um, there's different methodologies. Um, there's different philosophies when you study a, a phenotype versus just any variation uh, other than uh, normal. Um, and that kind of basis uh, is more on religion, I think, than science. Um, and now this now next generation sequencing, which has been around a while, it's probably not next generation anymore in its current iterations. Um, it can be potentially more sensitive than post cytometry. We'll show some data about this. It might be a little bit easier to standardize, but you know, right now as it's done, it's, it's pretty expensive, um, and it's kind of the slowest of these uh, techniques. I don't want to preach to the choir here. This is just an example of ALL um, and, this, uh, and, and flow cytometry from Brent Wood, Wood's lab. Um, the sensitivity in ALL, roughly 0.1 to 0.01. Uh, in AML, it's a little bit worse than that. I think most labs have difficulty calling MRD less than 0.1% uh, of Aaron Blass. QPCR um, is kind of uh, has an advantage of being fast, uh, ubiquitous, really. But there's really a, a limited number of markers that you can use in AML. So um, in version 16, A21s, you can do, um, you can develop assays for the main uh, genotypes of NPM1 mutation. And obviously, it's the standard in uh, BCRABLE, which is mostly a CML uh, domain. Um, also in the kind of uh, amplification platforms, it's now a digital PCR. Um, again, you know, what's the problem we have with uh, PCR? Low target number is a signal to noise uh, I issue, and so digital PCR tries to get around that by essentially partitioning your uh, target into separate um, either wells, which is this up on top here, this is the fluidine system, uh, or droplets, for instance, BioRad. And then you basically can count, you count uh, an application as positive or negative and can back calculate the initial target based on the Poisson distribution. Uh, 
And for those people who like um, mathematical trivia, and frankly, who doesn't, um, this is the first use of the Poisson distribution. It was in a paper uh, by, I believe, Horowitz in the 1850s. And it shows the first application of the, of, uh, the Poisson distribution, which was measuring deaths by mules to Prussian military officers. So if you ever get a trivia question and win a million dollars, um, I get part of it. This is, again, showing sort of the, the difference between analog and digital PCR, where in typical B PCR, you know, you basically are looking at these amplification curves of, of both your uh, target and your background. And there's a lot of assumptions in, in doing that. You, these, basically, the efficiencies of both your target and your background control gene have to be the same. Those can be affected by contaminants, sample qualities, et cetera. Um, with digital PCR, you're really doing um, end quantification, yes or no. Um, so that's much less dependent on efficiency, and you can usually get around a lot of problems with sample quality. So it's a little bit more robust, um, especially kind of at the low ends of a target. And this is just an example of, of the, the power, potential power of digital PCR. This is a different CML. Uh, this was the last study, which was looking at patients who were on uh, matinib or naloxonib or satinib for a great deal of time, uh, and then you discontinued the drug and see whether or not they would relapse or not. And typically in trials, about 50% of patients relapse. Um, quote, typical PCR was done on these patients, and then we also did a droplet digital PCR, which is about a half log more sensitive. And I think the, the most important thing curve here is on the right. Uh, these are looking at patients before discontinuation, and you found that people who were detectable by RT-PCR or undetectable by regular RT-PCR but detectable by digital PCR had a very, very high relapse rate. So the, the, the undetectable, which is a large proportion of patients that were detectable by digital PCR, they did relatively poorly. People who adopted digital PCR undetectable have a very low relapse rate. So this was, again, kind of showed in our hands, at least, that the droplet digital was probably uh, superior to the standard PCR at these very, very low target levels. Here's an example why next generation is uh, particularly appealing in AML. This is the NPM1 mutation, uh, which is typically a four base pair insertion. And this is looking at 346 patients. And you can see that type A, B, and C here take up the lion's share of patients, really about 90% of the patients. And you have this long tail of differences that aren't these major ones. So your typical PCR assay kind of works for these three. You won't detect any of these. So this is where next generation sequencing has an advantage because you can get all these other tails that you would never pick up with a standard assay. Um, we can start thinking about next generation sequencing in a couple of ways. First, you know, most of where it's being used in, in most of our diseases is just sort of a diagnostic panel. Um, now, the issue with that is that typical next generation sequencing has a tough time calling much less than 5% because of inherent false positive and false negative uh, issues. Um, so the typical sequencing panels that you might use for diagnostic, okay at uh, diagnosis, but really not really good for following up in residual disease status. And here's obviously some of the advantage of natural sequencing is that you can capture multiple variants within one gene region, a single assay. You can do multiplex of many uh, different targets. Um, it allows validation for only one type of workflow, uh, which potentially is quicker translation to the clinic um, with good throughput. But again, we talked about some of the disadvantages, uh, which is you need bioinformatics people. Um, those are costly. Um, and most of these assays take a fair amount of time, like, uh, you know, five days to a week or maybe even longer. And right now, despite, you know, a lot of promises in, in reagents becoming cheaper and cheaper, they really haven't very much because typically what happens is that there's improvements being made to the chemistries and the like, and your costs go back up again as soon as you make any, any inroads. So it's still pretty expensive. Um, now, one of the issues that, that we are trying to do with uh, MRD is really kind of change the next generation sequencing assays um, to be a little bit more sensitive and eliminate some of the background error. And this is usually done with uh, the insertion of unique molecular uh, markers, the UMIs, uh, which can kind of help you gain a consensus sequence uh, 
and prevent you from counting PCR duplicates where you might have PCR bias to certain regions and then therefore overcall those. An example uh, of one of these is uh, so-called uh, duplex sequencing. This is sort of a theoretical uh, issue of showing uh, background rates across the genome um, down to 0.5 to 1%, uh, whereas uh, if you basically do the duplex sequencing they're corrected, you can kind of get down to theoretical limit uh, 1 in 10 to the 7th. I'll show some data where um, we've done some of this um, we, and can get down to at least 10 to the 5th on a practical clinical samples compared to about 1% with conventional next generation sequencing. So let's think about a case study here of acute myeloid leukemia. Um, this very ultra small font is the 2022 European uh, net risk classification. Uh, now, really kind of compare using both conventional cytogenetics, uh, risks of favorable, intermediate, and adverse, and then plugging in some uh, other um, molecular genetic uh, assays. And so, for instance, um, if you have a mutated NPM1 without a FLT3 ITD, you are moved up to the favorable category. Mutated NPM with the ITDs uh, are back in the intermediate. Um, that just being said, um, you have to remember that favorable is a relative term. These the groups still can maybe get a 40% survival, uh, whereas this, this group here with conventional chemotherapy, the adverse group is probably around 10 to 20%. So it maps fairly well, but it's a little bit imperfect. Uh, and this is the ELN's take on the MRD assays are, are there. This is a pretty conservative take. Uh, the ELN tends to be that, that way. Um, established for MRD detection uh, is they consider flow and PCR. And these are the limits of detection uh, roughly. I think this is a uh, well, 10 to the minus 3 to 4. I think minus 4 is tough to get in most labs with flow. PCR, depending on what your target is, can potentially get 1 in 10,000 to 1 in a million, depending on what your target is and what how much input you put into it. Um, and again, applicability, most of the flow will have a marker. These PCR assays are hit targets in about 40% of the time. And again, next generation sequencing is potentially useful in all cases. Um, they considered exploratory, it's becoming less so very quickly. We'll talk about that soon, too. And again, the exploratory digital PCR, um, again, specific assays have to be developed. Those aren't quite commercial yet, um, but I think those will be ramping up fairly soon. So let's talk about the critical implications of, of MRD. So we have all of these classifications, and these mostly sprung out of uh, clinical trials. Uh, the first time I remember it happening was with the clinical trial with Myotard, uh, where, uh, where in those cases, people would get into the CR, but they also had kind of a, a instant bystander effect on the platelets, and so you get incomplete platelet recovery. So that was the first time where the regulatory agencies actually allowed for something with CR that wasn't completely normal count. And so we've kind of gone to CRIs and CRPs and all of these subsets of CRs. And what the curve on the left shows is none of those matter when you take into account MRD. So these are relapse rates um, in conventional chemotherapy. And you can see the only one that has a lower relapse rate is complete remission without MRD. All these other subcategories of CRP without MRD or CR with MRD, they all do terribly. And this is a lot of the flip side of this. The only curve that you're safe in CR is if we are without MRD, and this is uh, defined by uh, flow cytometry. So there's been recently a meta-analysis done uh, in MRD AML. Uh, this is following the uh, ALL meta-analysis that was done a couple of years ago, and it really shows pretty much the same thing. If you look at 61 studies across 9,000 patients, if you look at either disease-free survival, overall seems to be survival, there's a relative risk of around two and a half to three fold for MRD positivity while in remission. Um, so this is the people who are MRD negative and positive, and these are their survival curves. Um, but you know, interestingly enough, I mean, there's a lot of people who are MRD negative who still die, and there's a lot, and there are people who are MRD positive who don't relapse. And we can talk about why that might be in, in a few minutes. Um, this is sort of your stick uh, analysis looking at uh, MRD risk. And you can see no matter pretty much 
whether it's in, uh, measured in deduction, consolidation, after consolidation, the relative risks are equally bad. Uh, for how you measure it by flow, by PCR, they're all equally bad, except for conventional cytogenetics and genetics in fish, where there's an overlap with unity, and that's simply because uh, the assays aren't that sensitive for, for cytogenetics genetics in fish. Um, and whether you do it on bone marrow or peripheral blood or uh, both, again, doesn't matter. Your relative risk is, is about three. So no matter how you cut it, MRD is bad. And surprisingly, it's really bad even after a full transplant, which you would think that, that you might be able to overcome small amounts of MRD with an ablative transplant, but it's actually pretty difficult to overcome. These are two different studies. And, the, and what it shows is that if you have active disease, that means greater than 5% blast, your survival is equally dismal that if you're in remission with MRD. So the only group that does well are remissions without MRD. So that's true in chemotherapy, and it's surprisingly even true in transplant. And this just uh, shows, uh, we'll follow up on this in a minute, in a second, um, this is looking at a randomized uh, trial of uh, MDS and high-risk AML uh, that compared um, ablative transplants to reduce intensity transplant. This uh, trial was called off because the reduced intensity group had a very, very high relapse rate compared to the, the ablative groups, um, which, which kind of threw a wrench in it. Uh, and when you look at the impact of MRD in that trial and with all other trials in transplant, um, this is kind of, again, what the stick thing shows. And it basically shows that all these studies agree that AML, MRD, including CR before an allotransplant transplant is a very worse survival after transplant. And that's true of ablative. It's even especially more true in reduced intensity where you're really relying just on the GVL effect to uh, cure disease. This is a, actually a pretty interesting study showing how uh, flow complements morphology in, in, in detecting uh, and predicting response. So these are probably survival. And so this, this basically, first you look at people who have a negative MRD test. And if their f morphology shows less than 5% or greater 5%, it doesn't make any difference. The MRD basically calls your survival, even no matter what side of that 5% you're on. If you're positive MRD, you're better off if you have less blast. That makes some sense. But then if you say, let's just look at morphology, here's patients who are in remission, less than 5% blast by morphology, and basically your survival is based on how much MRD you've got. Same is true with greater than 5%, same scale. So MRD assessment by flow cytometry, I think would be fair to say, is a little bit more accurate in predicting um, response uh, compared to morphology. And in fact, in, in, in our center now, um, the pathologists often don't even make a call um, morphologically on the actual number of blasts. They rely on flow cytometry to make that call. Now, next generation sequencing um, and flow cytometry has started being compared head to head. And a number of studies have, have shown what's on the left here. Uh, if you're in next generation sequencing negative for MRD and flow negative, you do the best. The, the worst is next generation sequencing positive and flows positive. And the kind of intermediate is if you have a discordance. And we'll show the amount of discordance in a, in a few minutes in another study we've done. This is another similar study that's come out recently. shows basically the same thing, that the, this is kind of flipped on its head, that the best group is if you're negative, negative both, and then you have kind of a stratified best on your positivity if it's discordant or concordant. Um, this is kind of the showing, that was the last one was in chemotherapy. This is showing the same thing um, with, uh, in the uh, transplant setting. Again, he, this is using here, error corrected and flow. This is uh, error corrected sequencing here. This is flow on the right. They show the same thing. If you're MRD positive, your relapse rate is much higher. Uh, and, and basically all other categories are much lower. So we recently did a head-to-head um, -head comparison of air-corrected sequencing um, in the SWOG patients, uh, about 70 of them, uh, where these patients were in CR and they had Brentwood's flow cytometry done on them. Um, 
And we have a 29 gene panel that we're going to do on these patients. Um, what we found is that remission, uh, well, first off, we found that, that about 90% of patients had at least one variant that you could track. Um, the average VAF in remission was 0.2. This is the range. Uh, 42.04. Most common suspects, the ones that you would expect, all patients had at least one variant, um, and 68% had a diagnostic variant that was found in the remission sample. And here's the head to head comparison flow negative, flow positive, duplex sequencing negative, positive. The concordance rate, flow, nextration, sequencing, both positive or both negative, is about 70%. You had 8% of patients who were sequencing negative flow positive, and you had 25% that were flow negative and duplex sequencing positive. So that's a pretty high number. Of the discordant cases with sequencing positive and flow negative, nine of those patients relapsed, so over half of them. Um, of the five discordants, flow positive, nextration sequencing, only one relapsed. So this is showing some preliminary data suggesting that some of these more sensitive duplex sequencing uh, may be a little bit more robust. This is now, you can kind of <clears throat> call mutations in various ways, right? You could say um, you have to basically have a very low frequency over some defined cutoff. You can say detection of any mutation. Uh, you could say with DTAs, without DTAs. So we did these basically, since this was exploratory, we did these by six different definitions of how you would call a mutation positive. And here's the flow. The flow alone, your time to relapse, relapse free survival, and overall survival of flow positive is associated with a relative risk of load free twofold. The thing that performs the best in our hands was this definition, non-DTA mutation with a variant frequency of 0.1 but an MPM1 of uh, greater than 0.1, this is kind of the ELN definition. And there, compared to flow, you see a pretty dramatic increase in the odds ratio of sevenfold at the time of relapse, fivefold for relapse rate survival, and fivefold for, for overall survival. So in this definition, in this select patient population, um, the corrective sequencing uh, looks a lot more powerful than flow cytometry. And here are your, your curves, um, relapse free survival, duplex sequence negative, positive, um, time to relapse, sequencing negative, positive. So it looks fairly, fairly interesting. Uh, what we're doing now is validating this. Um, we had another 250 patients with pair sample, which also have paired proof of blood because what we'd like to do, obviously, is get to the point we are in uh, monitoring in CML where we never do bone marrow anymore. And I think that some of the sensitivity of these um, assays are getting to the point where I would not be surprised if peripheral blood carries the day. This is especially true since many times by the time you get a sample for sequencing or by flow, it's the second or third pull and you're getting mostly peripheral blood anyway. Let's skip to this. So one of the things to think about is we see these patients, and, and I don't have the answer here. This is kind of ongoing work. You see patients who are MRD negative, and most of them stay negative, but many of them are who return to positive. And you have these patients who are MRD positive, and, and many of them relapse, but some of them stay positive and don't relapse. And so why is that? Well, this might just be getting a better mousetrap, right? It might just be that you get more sensitive assays. You're going to pick up all the ones who are going to go north here versus those who are going to stay in remission. So if you had a better assay, you might be able to distinguish. This just may be disease burden. Um, but it also may depend on, on the actual mutation involved, right? Um, same is true in this case. Um, which patients are these that linger? These might be mutations like chip mutations that linger. Uh, it may well be the other mutations um, are tolerated um, by, uh, and maybe swept up by the immune system. It might also depend on cell lineage. There's been a, a number of small studies now in AML and in AOL uh, that show that some of these lingering mutations that you pick up um, persist because they're actually not in the lineage of note. Uh, in, in CML, we see this. The BCR able can stick around, and we found it in the lymphoid cells. The same is, appears to be true of, of some of the myeloid malignancies. But what you're doing is picking up, uh, since it's a stem cell disease, you're picking up residual um, molecular mutations in the lymphoid cells that aren't going to contribute to a relapse clone. 
Um, this gets even more complicated uh, when you think about there's data, at least in the MPM world, that the order of mutation makes a difference in how patients be, uh, behave. So in that case, uh, the complexity really, really skyrockets, and those are issues that are probably going to be bit, be addressed by alternative strategies like single-cell approaches. So now I'd like to kind of spend our wet in the last 10 minutes or so um, talking about two national uh, initiatives um, that are uh, really looking at MRD that I think will have some pretty powerful impact on how we do business. The first is the new precision medicine initiative from the NCI, so-called MyoMatch, and the second is a, a new proposal that uh, I'm leading up with uh, Coleman uh, <coughs> and uh, Chris Jorgen, Coleman Lindsay and Chris Horgan at Farber and, uh, and the uh, NIH. So the first idea is the whole myomatch thing. So as you know, right now in the cooperative groups, the uh, the Alliance and, and uh, ECOG and SWOG, in the past people have gone kind of gotten their own separate protocols and gone their own way. We've been trying for the last five years to really have these cooperative groups cooperate so that um, there'll be a certain set of studies and if SWOG is running a trial, let's say an MPM1 mutation, uh, the Alliance and ECOG would uh, all enroll into that. Likewise, if the Alliance has a mutation uh, uh, protocol for for two mutations, the, the cooperative groups will enroll in those. And what MyoMatch is is it basically looking at um, defining protocols based on what mutations patients have, and so patients will uh, undergo a screen protocol, uh, and that's uh, will be cytogenetics and Next sequencing done within three days, and based on what their cytogenetic mutation studies goes, they will be put on one of various uh, targeted protocols. Uh, these, as opposed to the old days with uh, intergroup trials with their giant phase two trials, these will all be a series of uh, MRD-based trials, at first by flow cytometry, so it will be phase two MRD-driven trials. Uh, and the idea would be you'll get the assessment of MRD status, and then if they are negative, they would stay on and be followed. Um, if they are positive, it would be put on so-called MRD eraser trials, the tier two levels, again, based on um, available studies and mutational status. So this is really trying to get at really, really uh, focused, targeted uh, trials. Uh, the assay that we so-called in MDNet will have uh, flow cytometry be done by Brent Wood. Cytogenics and FISH is, uh, will be done by MinFang. And this was all done uh, also by uh, contracts um, by Lidos. So um, none of, no institution got to pitch uh, their particular place and their particular assay. This is all done by a pretty sec secretive process. Um, where they, uh, Lidos did their due diligence and then say, suddenly uh, dropped contracts on places. Um, so cytogenics will be done by men. Uh, this will be done in three days. Targeted panels uh, with the Genexus system will be done at Frederick's in the, uh, on most of the week and the Fred Hutch on the weekend. And then we'll be, they'll be testing a targeted gene panel um, as sort of an exploratory to compare with uh, flow cytometry. And this is sort of how the samples are dished out. This is kind of more detailed than you actually know, uh, need to know. But it's um, been an enormous amount of work to actually coordinate this all. And I think it will probably be online to start probably around the first of the year with the first three trials opening up. Again, we're using the Genexus system. Uh, this can give a run of a large panel, which I'll show in, in a couple of days. Um, this is the panel, both RNA, uh, fusion, and DNA mutation uh, possibilities. Um, we've done validation on this, um, and the reproducibility is fantastic. Um, these are done both at um, Fredericks and at the Fred Hutch, so 99%. Sensitivity, 99%. Specificity was 100%. Um, the foot mutations with this system can get up to about 117 base pairs, and then, like most systems, you have a hard time reading them. Um, but that's okay because in our hands, in our libraries, um, the foot two mutations you know can go up to 300 base pairs. But the number of percentage of mutations that are larger than 117 
is about 8% of the total. So there will be some cost of business of losing some foot through ITDs, but it won't be many. This is just an example of some of our uh, sensitivity. This is uh, compared our next gen Illumina sequencing to the GenX sequencing, and it shows, again, it, it's, it's pretty spot on so far. Um, next, we transition to the FNIH. Um, and if you have never worked with the FNIH, this is kind of a very interesting institute. They, they basically go out and seek uh, research ideas that are not readily fundable in kind of conventional NIH ways. Um, and then they seek industry partners, um, and everyone kind of ponies up and becomes partners. And to for and so they asked me to pitch a project uh, after we got done with the ALL project, and I pitched MRD and went through a bunch of hoops. And here we are. So we have various people from academia who are kind of uh, serving in this. Um, the industry now this is out of date. We now have 15 industry partners. Um, these are both pharma companies who are greatly interested in in and turning MRD into a potential surrogate for clinical trials. Um, there are biotech um, companies who are interested in getting their biotech um, in, endorsed, uh, and it includes the FDA to both uh, work with study design on how you would do uh, MRD studies, uh, as well as what it would take for um, uh, machine platforms to be actually uh, meet FDA standards. And we, we basically came up with four project aims and then let all the various partners integrate um, and self-populate these committees and however they want to. And they can be as many as they want. We have a standards com uh, committee for um, so that we can basically have um, sets of standards that can be available to uh, all investigators around the U.S., all different platforms, um, so we can have, have a set of common tools. Um, we had a lot of... At first, we didn't think there were many standard makers out there. They've kind of come out of the woodworks with some really interesting technologies. So we'll be testing those against our various platforms to see which standard uh, assays work best in which platforms. Um, we have a methods group, which is looking at um, new uh, diagnostic methods out there um, and comparing them to in retrospective samples um, from clinical trials, SWOG, uh, pharma, et cetera. Um, the idea there is that it's not just a more sensitive test that, that's important. Um, you, it has to perform better than the standard. So, um, for instance, flow cytometry. Um, so, you know, at some level, all of us will have mutations, and um, you can imagine a lousy MRD test has a relative risk of relapse of one. As you get better, it gets better, and then as everyone becomes po positive, the relative risk drops down again. So we're going to look for an assays that, are, that will outperform those kind of standard assays. Um, we then have a, a group that will be integrating the new methods into ongoing trials, um, especially I, I, my pharma and some uh, myelomatic precision med initiatives, uh, and we're working with the uh, F, uh, panel, working with the FDA to really work established guidelines for technical validation and, and uh, working on clinical trial design. So you can imagine how this would work, right? If you had a new technology, the first thing you would do is, is kind of go up and, and use the standards that we established uh, and make sure it behaves as you'd expect to. And then if you that works, you would then test it against the retrospective samples that we've accumulated. We now have have our tabs on several thousand uh, serial samples from various intergroup trials. Um, if those methods look good and look to beat the existing technology, uh, step three then would be obviously to roll them out and try, try them in a prospective val uh, trial to validate them. So with all of this, you know, there are some kind of known issues um, going forward with next-generation sequencing, and here's just a, a few of them. You know, the issue of stability of, of, of clonal heterogeneity, right, and, and the evolution of clonal heterogeneity with clones coming and going with the selective pressure of chemotherapy. Um, you have to deal with intrinsic rates, which you can control some of these by um, UMIs and the like, but there's always going to be some in, 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 error rate intrinsic in any amplification steps. Um, understanding clonality, that this is work that probably will be best uh, done by single cell sequencing techniques. Um, and in uniform reporting standards, right? we don't know how many, we, we haven't come to a standard yet on how many reads where you really need to call a variant. Um, we really don't have standardized uh, filtering systems, um, how to call variant calls. 
Um, and the industry is still kind of unsettled on how many controls you need, how many duplicates, and whether those will vary from platform to platform. Um, but even more importantly, I think that there are there are kind of different bins of um, questions you can ask. And this is a slide I borrowed from my, my friend uh, Chris Horgan uh, when we put together the FNIH prep platform. This is kind of on the top of our mind. Um, there are clinical questions, right? Um, whether or not MRD positive or negative, that's pretty artificial. You know, shouldn't we be using an exact number? And can kinetics of MRD guide us more than just positive or negative? I suspect so. Um, we, we are talking about targeted therapy based on, on MRD. Um, we think that's going to work, but, um, you know, you never know. Maybe the better strategy is hitting all leukemia as hard with kind of broad agents, let natural selection take its course, and then use next generation sequencing targeted therapy to sort of guide as a mop-up. Um, we don't know yet technically, you know, is it really going to be um, better than flow, or is it going to be complementary? Um, are single cell techniques going to uh, help at all um, that, in, compared to just the gross estimates by uh, bulk sequencing, next generation sequencing? And I think the million dollar one is, is can blood substitute for marrow that would have the most clinical I impact, and would have actually a lot of uh, monetary impact as well. And then probably even the most important is the biological question of why what makes some leukemias more sensitive to others? Um, why do some people who are MRD positive fail to relapse while MRD negative patients, some of them do? Um, and what makes discordance between different assays, if flow of positive and next generation is negative and vice versa? What types of cases are those? Why are, are people discordant in trying to understand that? So I think our take home messages is ELN recommendations uh, for qPCR is currently the CBF and PM1 and b able. Uh, Cyto and FISH have a pretty low sensitivity, but can, can be helpful, obviously, although it's with some of the whole genome sequencing now that the WASH-U is put on, uh, we might have to wonder if Cyto and FISH is going to be a thing of the past soon. Um, most full cases um, are show positivity by next generations, but there's some discordance, so we have to understand what that means. Um, weight mutations are often lost at relapse, but they're helpful if they remain positive. And uh, DTA mutations that, you know, you and I are kind of sitting around with uh, often persist in cured patients, um, but it doesn't mean necessarily uh, that you can have a DTA mutation post-chemotherapy. It may have different implications than it has in, in you and I. So pretty much everything in the world can be put into the surgery only classification scheme, and I, here I've put uh, MRD in it. The good uh, is uh, MRD negative, favorable risks, uh, side out. Uh, in those patients, you can consider chemotherapy consolidation as, as part of your therapeutic uh, platform. Uh, the bad is uh, MRD ne negative, but intermediate or high risk, um, MRD positive, favorable risk. These patients probably should be offered a clinical trial um, or, more, or more stronger methods such as transplant. Uh, and the uglier is uh, high-risk disease uh, positivity um, in, in MRD positive. Those are people who are clearly exceedingly high risk of relapse, and those are people who should be uh, given a stem cell transplant or a clinical trial. And this is how we would like to see things work in the best possible world. At diagnosis, we would use molecular diagnostics to offer a prognosis and pick a drug. Uh, at CR, uh, we would determine whether we need to change therapy. We can use this as drug development. We can use this for MRD uh, relation trials. And obviously, what our wish list for an assay would be fast, reliable, sensitive, flexible, and cheap. But as filmmaker Jim Jarmusch told uh, Polygot uh, Tom Waits, Fast, cheap, and good, pick two. If it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's cheap and good, it won't be fast. If it's fast and good, it won't be cheap. Fast, cheap, and good, pick two words to live by. And with that, um, this is Fred Hutch here on the uh, right. Um, I thank you for your uh, patience and listening in. Thank you.
Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Radich, for a wonderful overview of a very uh, compelling story here. And as you catch your breath, I'm going to recommend to our participants and audience that they go ahead. And now they have a chance to type in their questions and comments uh, on this presentation. And while they do that, I'm going to uh, invoke my right, and I'll ask the first question as today's moderator, and ask you, I'm assuming at the Hutch you see a fair number of patients who've been referred in from other institutions. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we oh yeah, tons. Right. So could you characterize for us what is the kind of workup that you face uh, for AML in with the patients that are referred in. Is there a reasonable assessment of MRD already, or is that something that has to be done from the very beginning once they're in your clinic? No, you, you, usually um, the patients, especially our neck of the woods, you know, we're up, uh, there's a lot of patients here that, that are seen in, you know, Montana, Alaska, et cetera, et cetera, where there's just not as much access to, to some of the sophisticated stuff that we're talking about. Um, so sure. typically when, when patients come in, uh, they'll get, you know, the standard cytogenetics, CGAP, FISH, uh, um, and a mutation panel, at least, in the flow cytometry. So we've kind of started from scratch. Okay. Very good. And is there, uh, amongst the people that uh, refer patients to you, are they eager to have some kind of participation in the trials that you're mentioning here? Do they yeah, see yeah, the yeah, we actually, promise of yeah, what yeah. you're doing? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're kind of a research center. Um, they they're come often with a purpose, and, and I would say most of our acute LUCs are put on trials. Uh, the national average is probably 15 20%. I would suspect we have about at 70%. Um, and for patients with transplant, um, they're all in clinical trials. So the average transplant patient is put on, I believe, eight different trials, um, you know, a combination of GVHG prophylaxis and infectious disease issues and preventive measurements, the whole, whole thing. Very good. Thank you. And now we have a question from our audience for you. Uh, when is the optimal time uh, for the first MRD evaluation? Yeah, that's a great and practical question, right? Um, I, typically, day 14 marrows are, are a little early, uh, frankly. Um, I think day 28 or, you know, after, after you know, the people who recover their counts after the first induction is, is a good time. Um, that being said, it's, it's, it's an interesting issue um, because, you know, there's getting more and more difference in intensities of regimens. And it's probably the case, although we're not proven yet, that some of the more uh, less intensive regimens might have to wait longer. So, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to establish with the FNIH is, is getting lots of samples from, from different therapies and different endpoints to see if MRD means the same thing across different therapeutic modalities, and then what's the kinetics, uh, the, the optimal kinetics, uh, which are probably different for someone who is given intensive seven and three therapy versus someone who might be getting a less intensive regimen. So I think the, the kind of uh, verdict's out on that quite yet. Okay. Another question here is uh, the questioner says is really more of a workflow question, and I think we're going to have quite a few of those in our discussion uh, today. At, at what point in the workup is the MRD ordered, before or after you have other ancillary studies back, obviously like flow cytometry? And the follow-up question to that uh, is if any of the other studies show residual positivity, do you have a mechanism in place to cancel the MRD testing? Yeah, yes. So, um, you know, typically what is done at our institute is most of the MRD testing is, is done by flow. Um, and then, you know, depending on, there's almost an automated, but the pathology is set up almost an automated tool where um, based on the person's, if they've had known molecular markers in the outside, um, those will be done selectively, like so if, if someone had a 
NPM and a FLIT3, there are selective at test assays for that rather than a whole genome panel. Um, so we, we really, it's really customized um, based on what we know about the patient's history. Um, if they're brand new, um, then typically at diagnosis, you would do the flow cyto next generation sequencing. And then based on what those panels show would guide the, the reflex monitoring uh, down, the, down the line on therapy. Very good. We have another question here. Uh, can a patient who has a history of blood transfusion, a patient with a history of blood transfusion, uh, in that case, could that transfusion affect the variant detection in the NGS analysis? There's probably a not enough cells by the conventional methods um, that that would interfere. Um, that being said, what we're finding, though, is with some of the more sensitive methods, it's not, not as much as blood transfusion, but it's certainly a, getting to be an issue with um, transplantation is that the donor cells, if you look hard enough, we have a study we'll be putting out here soon, if you look hard enough by very sensitive next generation sequencing, everyone out there, normals, has chip, even 18-year-olds. Okay. So what we're soon having to come to for the transplant setting is we're probably going to have to do sequencing of the donor uh, because otherwise, you know, when you look at like, these sensitive uh, downstream, <clears throat> you may have a hard time understanding what mutations are, you know, donor as versus what might be residual uh, disease in the patient, which is going to make life uh, more expensive and more complicated. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> good answer. Um, uh, the questions are flowing, so uh, hang in there with me. Uh, for MRD detection, is it necessary to look for mutations in the coding region only, or can we use alterations in non-coding regions? Oh, that's may that's have been really, affected by that, whole genome sequencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting because most people, have, you know, kind of focus on on um, known pathogenic, you know, reads. Um, but you do that, you lose a lot of information, right? Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there might be uh, unique uh, mutations in, like uh, this person suggesting, in, in uh, different areas that could be useful for tracking. Um, I think that is a work that's sort of in progress by a lot of groups. Um, Right now, people focus on known pathogenetic mutations, and, and, uh, um, but I think there is some mileage to consider whether you should cast your net a little bit wider. But I think uh, okay. verdict's out on that right now. Have you uh, yourself in your uh, research lab been uh, pursuing some of those ideas? Uh, yes, but okay, again, uh, not ready for prime time, you know. Uh, as we say in the lab, most ideas are wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've heard about uh, dropping uh, the morphologic exam, which uh, uh, I suppose is uh, some progress and would startle some of our participants here. But uh, clearly there's a lot of interest here in uh, really beginning this uh, journey, regardless of where people are practicing. So let me ask you this question. Uh, if you have an in-house lab in a hospital, uh, when would you advise uh, folks to start setting up in NGS in-house, in addition to existing flow cytometry tests? Yeah, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and since I'm not a medical economist, I, I <laughs> Uh, all this stuff is all this stuff is very expensive to set up, right? And and it takes a, a lot of support uh, to do. So I think you really have to ask yourself, since there's a lot of commercial entities that are getting better and better at that. Uh, at the end of the day, is it better to send some of these things out? Uh, do we have to have mm -hmm. you know every group um, you know doing this? I mean, I I I'm be happy. Uh, we do sort of all of ours on sort of a research basis. I'm happy to send it out to someone to, to can do it fast and and you know furiously. <laughs> um, okay. So I don't know. That's a, that's a real question about about when you really think about all it takes to do this. Um, that's quite an investment, um, mm -hmm. and, and I, I I'm wondering if it's if 
it just makes more sense to, as more and more of these places, you know, come up that's going to be able to do high quality sequencing, um, whether or not that's going to be the most cost effective route. Very good. That's a, you, you raise an interesting point and one I really wanted to get back to. Um, how does one uh, understand what you call error corrected sequencing? Is that mainly a development within the software that's used in the analysis, or no, is it in, it's, no, it's in the it's sequencing like, so itself? I, no, I mean it's, it's actually you know you you add these barcodes to um, the DNA so that you can kind of tell what are unique sequences versus if you have a bias and you're amplifying the same area over and over again. And we and we were talking things about duplex sequencing, what, how that's done, if you can imagine that um, whereas you, you might make some of the methods might make a crap off of one strand of the DNA. If there's an error rate in one to a thousand and just a library crap, that kind of seals your level of sensitivity, right, at one in a thousand. Mm -hmm. um, but if you basically sequence <clears throat> off both strands and then just call mutations where the complementary base pair shows up in both of the, the libraries you've made, um, then your theoretical limit is 10 to minus 3 times 10 to minus 3 times, you know, the combination of, you know, AT, GC stuff. Um, so that brings your theoretical sensitivity down to about 1 in 10 to the 7th. Um, so that's kind of what you're, what you're doing is you're just basically um, checking your math in a sense. I understand. Yes. Very good. One of the questions that we always get with our audience is uh, talking about the sample types that were analyzed within the NGS data you discussed. Uh, what sample types were in these studies of fresh bone these are, marrow? Yeah, yeah these, these are pretty much all bone marrow. Uh, a few okay. purple blood sh uh, shown in, but um, you know, there's a lot of work by a lot of groups now trying to compare bone marrow and uh, peripheral blood head-to-head. -head. Brent Wood has put out a pretty good paper on peripheral blood versus bone marrow and flow cytometry, um, and it's surprisingly good. It was published in blood, I think, a year or two ago. Um, the peripheral blood lines up with the bone marrow cell pretty darn good. Um, oh. and, 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 and as I noted, um, you know, flow necessary sequencing and stuff is great if you get an early pull of the marrow, right? If, if that's how your your workflow is going. Um, but if your flow, your dextrogeneration is your last pull from the bone marrow, then you're pretty much just getting peripheral blood anyway. Okay, that's very good to know. We have a question about germline mutations. So, would you like to? Uh, uh, tell us how germline mutations would enter into the calculus for you. Well, it's, yeah, it's always, you know, whenever you see a mutation, you've got it, you, at diagnosis, it's kind of hard to tell. When you can usually see the germline mutations is if you get a sample in a patient and their flow is negative and their morphology is negative, and you have this mutation that has, you know, a high VAF, that's usually pretty suspicious that something germline is going on. And in those cases, you might have to do, you know, take another sample from the buccal cell or, um, you know, some people try to investigate it in lymphoid cells and the like. But that's usually your first clue that something's going on is when they look by their admission in all other ways, except you've got this, you know, VAF of like 0.5. And you know that it's hard to imagine that's true if, they, if, if there's no, if that was the leukemic clone in that context. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a final question here, and I want the audience to know all of your questions will be supplied uh, to Thermo Fisher, and they will make sure that you get an answer as well. We will as well here at CAF today. But the final question for you, Dr. Radich, is the following. Uh, as you know, some patients may have progressed to AML from MDS. Oh, yeah. In these yep, yep. patients, will MRD impact your treatment decision making? That is a really good question, and, and that's interesting because if you, even if you clear out the AML clone, the MDS clone often is still there. So um, it kind of can help you look at the AML clone, um, and that's helpful, but it's certainly it's hard to assess, you know, the underlying MDS by that. It's, it's usually still there. Um, so, you know, even when we take people to transplant, we expect their NGS uh, 
to be positive, even if the flow is negative. Um, so if that ends up being a, a difficult, you have to kind of really uh, analyze that situation very carefully. So it tells you what one part of the disease is doing, but not the other. Very good. Thank you. And with that, I will give you the last word uh, with my thanks for just a wonderful presentation today. And I'll begin to sum up. Here we want again thank Dr. Gerald Radich of the Fred Hutchinson Center in Seattle for a wonderful presentation that I know you'll want to review once it's up online at captodayonline.com. You can see that in about a week and share that with colleagues. I want to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, for their special educational grant that's allowed us to bring you Dr. Radich's incredibly wonderful uh, lecture today. And it's rich in data, as you all know, who've been listening. So I want to thank uh, Thermo Fisher. Finally, I want to thank all of you who've taken time out to join us today on this very important webinar. We've had an enormous audience, and we look forward to your responses and to your joining us again soon. So just to quickly wrap up once more, I want to thank Dr. Gerald Radich. I want to thank Thermo Fisher. I want to thank all of you. And with that, I will let this webinar now close and wish you all a very good day. Thank you.